Okay, very good morning. Hope everyone is well. It's Thursday the 8th of August. Going to have a quick review of what's been going on. So, talking about China, the Yuan fix, of course, is absolutely critical at the moment to watch and monitor and really dictates all the market sentiment at present. So, as per these headlines here, we'll review that and what's the current status. We're also going to talk about the inversion of the US yield curve. Not only that, but crude hit a seven month low yesterday. Gold's at a multi year or well, record high, uh, having gone north of 1500. Um, hedge funds have become basically the most bearish on stocks in, in a long while as well. So, we're going to talk about what does that mean. But a lot of things happening at the moment. Um, but that's all broader context. If we actually just start the briefing with the actual charts this morning, uh, equities recovered. So much like on the sell-off that we had on Monday with the original episode of concerns about potential mass capital outflows out of China as they allowed that currency to weaken, we recovered quite sharply the following day. And then we had kind of similar yesterday, miniature kind of route in equity markets, only for then a pretty solid recovery to take hold into the close. So <clears throat> at the moment, losses remain contained. Um, gold albeit still elevated somewhat, just given the, the magnitude of the move yesterday. And we were talking in the briefing about how we you know, could see further upside in gold and that materialized pretty quickly, even before really America came into the market, it was already on the ascent um, up here, looking on the top right hand corner. So a little bit of backing off from that run up of a decent kind of $24, $23 move, I think is warranted. The point being is we're still um, a clear distance above the 1500 level for the moment. Uh, the pivot pr providing a little bit of near term support. Um, and as I said, oil price is going to be the other one we're going to look at um, with some significance because it's prompting a lot of new uh, OPEC rhetoric apparently behind the scenes. Saudi having lots of conversations now about potential intervention in order to prop up prices, given the fact that we've hit a fresh seven month low. So let's get straight into the headlines. And then Sam will look at the charts in more detail. Uh, starting off with this, China sets yuan fixing stronger than expected, helping soothe nerves, so not allowing the currency to uh, continue to weaken too much. Um, the one thing that they did do, though, is they did set the daily fixing um, at 7.0039. So if there was that key psychological or symbolic level of 7, it's the first time since 2008 uh, that the fixing was weaker than seven. Again, the point being here is although it's got to that mark, that was actually stronger than what markets were expecting. Um, looking at this then, a couple things to be aware of. Uh, really interesting comment from Goldman Sachs, their Asia Pacific head. And I think this was really important what he was saying. He said basically right now he suspects that China, they want to desensitize the market to this magic number of seven and make sure that they are not going to have capital outflow problems. And I think that's, that's exactly right. Uh, I think that strategy from China um, is absolutely what their, their intention is. You know, seven, why seven? Well, again, it's one of those technical almost analysis indicators where it becomes self-fulfilling if enough people believe in it. And yes, in previous years, seven has been that barrier and the market has bounced in terms of the weakening of the yuan. But seven is just a number and, and seven could become seven and a half. No problem, as long as this is done in a managed way, which resets us, the market and our behavior, that now seven is seven and a half. Seven and a half can become eight and so on. Kind of like the whole 2019 issue where the global economy is heavily indebted and yet that's just the new norm. No one talks about sovereign issues so much now, but a few years ago, that was the big issue, downgrading of sovereign nations like the US back in, what, 2011. So point being is, I think China rightly are trying to reshape the market's feelings around that seven so that they can create some room as the uh, economic impact of the tariffs starts to hurt their economy more than Technically speaking, they're looking to counteract some of that well, as well with other measures by allowing this currency to weaken, but importantly, it not resulting in capital outflows. So yeah, absolutely spot on comment I thought from Goldman's this morning. Um, this is what it looks like as well when they talk about stabilization of the Yuan. Uh, here it is. 
PBOC sitting stronger than expected, fixed, albeit granted above seven. Um, but here it is having spiked right just a few days ago. Um, we've now come off just a touch. The other thing that's happened overnight, we did have some uh, Chinese trade data um, to give you the stats here. July exports rose 3.3% from a year earlier. Um, that's the fastest level since March of this year. Uh, stronger than expected, but imports remained weak. They declined by 5.6%, um, so continuing to highlight potentially some of the weak domestic demand. Uh, but exports perhaps getting a little bit of a side kick from the fact that the currency has been weakening. Um, so all in all, stabilization in Yuan and Chinese trade data actually not that bad. I mean, the export numbers were surprisingly strong and exceeded expectations, so it helped to calm some of these growing nerves in markets this week. One thing on a broader context, though, that a lot of people are looking at is this. And this always comes about whenever there's, you know, quite extreme bouts of selling in the equity market. People start to get very gloomy about the economic future for the global economy. And now, inevitably, the news agencies start to feed that narrative. Obviously, and negative headlines are usually much more compelling a case than talking about positive things. But we are not short of negative catalysts in the market right now. Now, this, of course, is factual, but you know this has happened a few months ago and we averted that storm, but it's back in focus again. Basically, the inversion of the yield curve. The yield on the three-month U.S. Treasury traded as much as 41.23 basis points above that of the 10-year government bond in the U.S. That's the widest gap since 2007. Um, so, yeah, the difference between the three-month and the 10-year Treasury yields so investors seeing no end to yield curve inversion for the moment. Why is that important? Well, such an inversion of the yield curve has preceded basically every economic downturn or recession of the last half century. So that's the reason why people look at this more of an indicator, not necessarily if you're just trading government bonds and spreads, if you're looking at um, a sign about markets overall confidence in the future, this would be a negative uh, signal. The other thing, Tommaso keeps telling me about uh, is the amount of total negative yielding debt in the world. So about a quarter of the global bond market, which is equivalent to around 15 trillion US dollars, currently offers a negative interest rate. So just, just to be clear, you're, if you take that bond uh, as the person purchasing it, you're actually losing money. You're getting less at the redemption date 10 years down the line. So you would think, well, why on earth would someone do that? Well, when everything is falling, actually losing just a little is not as bad as losing a lot. So yeah, negative yielding debt has absolutely exploded over the course of basically the last couple of months. You can see it's gone from, it's basically more than doubled in a case of about one year, which is quite a frightening prospect about where how are central banks again this is what's going to make i think the next the next 18 months two years of financial markets so incredibly interesting is that central banks are facing quite huge obstacles as about how can they re-stimulate an economy given rates in many nations are so low still and the fact that the world is so indebted and that yields are already so heavily negative. It's going to be such an interesting time to see how they, they manage that. From a short-term intraday perspective, obviously, the more uncertainties there are, the more volatility it creates, the more potential opportunity, obviously, to trade. But yeah, just thought I'd point these things out. The other thing is, again, it's going to sound rather gloomy again, is hedge funds have turned their most bearish since 2016. So... Um, yeah, Sam's just saying to me, buy, buy, as soon as he starts hearing these headlines. He could be right on one point, so let's talk this through. So the details here is that the ratio of hedge funds long to short positions, this is known as net leverage, it's sunk to its lowest level since February of 2016. The bulk of those positions are basically short. So if you, what happens here is, um, every week we get updates from the CFTC about the market's futures positioning across different products. That allows us to see how long or short the market is in a more simple sense. The, the, the premise being the ratio of hedge funds long to short is now um, at its lowest since 2016, indicating that 
in the most in many years markets getting short so underlying even though equities have gone up to record high levels hedge funds are getting more and more building up their short positions now long positions among those funds this is what makes this potentially a, a storm brewing for market movement in the equity space is that apparently uh, the faith in crowded stocks has surged to a five-year high now to explain this what it means that is that those people who are long are basically highly concentrated in only a certain select a few stocks so particularly those in the software and biotech space the ones where the biggest large short positioning is in is in materials and financials you can I think the latter is pretty self-explanatory the economic slowdown materials will get hurt on the growth uh, prospects diminishing and financials in this low rate environment will also get hit point being is though the more concentrated a few names becomes well then if everyone's short if the market starts to come up well you're going to get a bit of a short squeeze and that's where you get these kind of episodes of quite sharp recoveries where we get a big sell-off and all of a sudden though market starts coming back up and as it comes back up starts then pressing a lot putting a lot of pressure on these short positions and some of them are gonna are gonna have to buckle and at that point the market jumps back up and we get a new elevated record high even though the market is short so yeah this the inversion of the yield curve um, the trade war risks yeah interesting definite interesting times from a macro top level perspective and, and certainly it does feel like um, you know the chips are kind of stacking up at the moment for uh, a significant episode of volatility at some point in the near future okay moving on um, looking at oil prices well let me just have a look yesterday was obviously really interesting we had a significant down day in price action yesterday particularly in the afternoon we obviously had the infantry data um, as well but I wanted to just quickly put it on a daily continuation chart so you can see the fact that briefly very briefly you can see here looking at the futures we got below that low point that we printed that kind of double bottom in June and that would put us back down to the lowest levels basically in seven months to the beginning of the year right into kind of mid-January but as you can see from the peak of price action that we printed uh, 23rd of April we've now pulled back 24% so obviously bear market territory if you're looking at the, the, the type of movement on the pullback that we've had so I'll let Sam give his thoughts technically about what he thinks about that but the point being is we know if we start looking at a longer time frame chart let's bring in this sweet spot here which is at 42 now you'll remember um, Saudi Arabia obviously at the moment have this very ambitious project called Vision 2030 which is a uh, diversification project away from its dependency on crude oil a necessity for that nation now given the fact that Americans and Russians have diminished the power that Saudi has in order to just manipulate supply to move the price of oil in that diversification plan they obviously need to raise money now part of that strategy would be then that the, the belief is that Saudi really needs oil trading north of $80 in order to finance this type of project however the price is coming against them so if anything they're offside in that trade if you want to look at it <coughs> excuse me in that way now what does that mean well the verbal rhetoric starts to come out from these these oil nations and particularly Saudi Arabia because they know if we can break below that June double bottom as we tested and seen a very very sharp bounce yesterday I mean we've bounced about a clear two dollars off that test but a break of that level technically really does open up a lot of clean air to bring us back down to these lows that we were we were trading right in the middle of that Q4 2018 uh, route that we had across global markets. And Saudi know that. So what have they done? They've already started verbally intervening in the market. So this is 101 OPEC strategy. Um, basically, the Saudi Saudi Arabia has phoned all other major oil producers, so including that of Russia to discuss possible policy responses um, as oil prices have hit this fresh seven month low the kingdom apparently that they said they will not tolerate a continued slide in prices they're considering all options 
And the important thing is, is they've kind of been brought into action by the severity and the pace of the sell-off yesterday. But this comes ahead of a OPEC gathering uh, happening in Abu Dhabi on the week starting the 9th of September. So pretty much a month to the date they're going to be meeting. This is one of their kind of uh, interim meetings on a catch-up of OPEC members. Um, because as you can see, they know, or we know, that they have been continuing to roll over supply cuts. Um, which has meant that OPEC output, uh, this is a graphic going back from March 2019 to the current day. And you can see OPEC output has continued to decrease. So you've got the volume here of millions of barrels a day. So it's gone from around 30.7 million in March all the way down to way sub 30. And yet, despite that, the price still keeps coming down. The idea here being then that because of these uh, multiple indicators about slowing economic growth, the demand at the moment is outpacing the supply cuts. Uh, the demand decrease that is so do OPEC need to take more aggressive action what I would say is if you're trading intraday um, that's a really big level now what we bounced off the low yesterday you can see it quite clearly from a technical area of support that's the key area to watch I think if we break that don't forget the $50 psychological handle is sitting just underneath there by about 58 cents that does open for me the trap door for a push lower Who's going to enjoy that price slide? Well, it does fit the narrative of Trump politically looking to manage the middle class with a kind of artificial tax cut, if you like, with cheaper prices at the pump. However, Trump starts to also get nervous when the price gets down to that um, 2018 low that we had down at the 42 handle. That's when those credit spreads of those US energy majors, which have borrowed a lot of debt in order to finance these projects to really... Um, make the most of the shale revolution with oil output in the US up at record levels, they start to be pressured. And then you'll see Trump quickly reversing his calls then if we ever got back down to that lower, lower bound price. So yeah, a couple of things to be aware of there for crude. I'll let um, Sam look at more of an intraday strategy with you guys. Um, <laughs> this is the Sun newspaper. Um, <laughs> When I first brought up this web page, I wasn't sure if I was looking at the right website. It looks more like a, a cartoon, but <laughs> I'm not, not going to judge. But the point being is that, you know, when it comes to information that can move financial markets, you've got to look at all press publications, and The Sun is no different. The Sun have a very good political correspondent, very timely with news and sources. And basically, he's come out with the latest piece this morning saying that a general election could be held on the 1st of November. Obviously, that's the day after a no deal. The idea being is that Boris can then go to the public, I've delivered you Brexit. And then the day after, he will call a general election. That's the latest rumor that's doing the rounds this morning. Okay, calendar wise, what have we got? This morning is particularly quiet, not too much going on. Um, you've got the weekly jobless data at 1.30. Wholesale inventory sales at three o'clock from the US is kind of a side point, I would say. Um, and that's about it. So really, I'd say calendar wise, there's not a great deal going on. Main take home points are a little bit of reprieve from the concerns emanating out of China. Uh, they did fix the currency just above seven. However, it was stronger than expected. Trade exports also exceeded expectations, so that should calm or alleviate some near-term concerns in the short term. However, a lot of headlines that are quite negative at the moment, hedge funds being bearish in their short positioning, accumulation. Um, you've got the inversion of the yield curve again, so I think definitely today's a more sentiment-driven day. I do think the volumes really will start to pick up and be much more US-centric. So I'd suggest really focusing your ammunition and energy capital towards that part of the day, keeping an eye on the equity market. Sure, uh, oil on that, that lower bound price as well, I think it's going to be quite key as we go forward throughout the day. Okay, that's it. Let me hand you over to Sam, and I wish you guys a good day. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, good morning. Just uh, going to bring the pound uh, into into play. It's having a bit of dollar weakness uh, for the euro and the pound against that dollar, uh, and just having a 
a quick look here is we, we're getting squeezed from both directions. We went through this yesterday and you can see we had a, a brief go at uh, trying again to get below the uh, lower part of that trend line and have a false break. It's uh, uh, a pretty tricky one to, to call what's going on there. But uh, more interesting, up from the, the top end, you're going to get the what would be the fourth test around today's R1, yesterday's high. So you can really see uh, pound going on. We, we've reiterated there's not really much driving things at the moment and sort of waiting for a clear break either way might be uh, the favoured move. Obviously, things are moving uh, better elsewhere in a market that's just been drifting, really, albeit higher but those uh, highs as well have been getting lower so worth just keeping an eye on what happens uh, around this uh, R1 top end of that trend uh, as well uh, for the price to get squeezed. Break above that obviously the, the main uh, target areas to look at you'd also want yesterday's high to go but uh, we'll be looking back to the high that we had of the week at 122.32 I think on the future uh, so worth keeping that marked up on the chart for the euro uh, we, we found support yet again uh, down on that low um, yesterday and we're just you know again similar to the pound in that we are just sort of drifting from both directions not necessarily in the shape of a pattern but those last two highs are, are, are coming down and those two lows as well uh, are getting higher so just getting squeezed in from both directions in terms of opportunity wise I think from the downside and it hasn't really caught hold of you know a real recovery from these this move that we had from the, the beginning of August to, to the upside but you know breaks of, of these lows uh, and then obviously back down to 112 uh, handle could be could be key for anyone looking for that dollar strength to resume and if we are to to break out of uh, this little uh, free session three day range you would obviously want uh, those highs to go we are coming to what's been a pretty key level over the last few days 112.54 was a uh, resistance point back on uh, Tuesday morning and then yesterday morning and uh, we're coming up to it today uh, as well and, and those levels as we just squeeze this chart to the left hand side you can see how important that was as it was the breakdown area uh, before we move lower on the 22nd so just a point of price action key level to be aware of 112.54 uh, and a half on the uh, on the futures there uh, to to uh, to have marked up quick look over and move to uh, gold which of course yesterday just kept pushing into the afternoon getting as high as 15.22 on the the futures in a bit uh, we have drifted down since then I think you know with this market in such a a strong move to the upside you can see uh, the opportunity may well be on a break of, of this trend from those highs yesterday to this morning's highs uh, looking to, to get long above that we were respecting a, uh, a trend line all yesterday and uh, let's have a look how that's sort of coming into play I mean, it depends I guess where exactly you would start that um, but if we get it on there there we go it's from the the 8:30 low on uh, Tuesday uh, matches up with the second test later that day before this morning and then just again now so price just getting squeezed in uh, the volume not necessarily going to be there but you can see at least you've got a quite well respected technical setup so you know the theory behind this would be you know waiting for that push to, to the upside but of course works to the downside as well whether you'd want to Know, get short gold uh, at the moment if the volume is not there to the downside uh, it might just give you a better opportunity on a break of that to prefer to, to wait for opportunities to go long on previous areas of, or, of resistance turn support or uh, just support in general but probably favouring the, the move to the upside uh, as this market of course is just keeping pushing on and on uh, the S&P we talked yesterday just about the, the, the area uh, around 28.80, let's move this to the left hand side and you can see the importance of of this point let me just circle or rectangle that area up, let's get it above the above the camera, all round here uh, pretty pretty important uh, and we're just coming back into that area where it was a bit of a mess and price couldn't really make a decision about where it wanted to go at the beginning of June and we are just perhaps looking to to slow down this uh, recovery uh, for now, uh, no real 
reason I would expect it to dramatically push higher today um, unless we were to get maybe above one of these kind of trend lines that you would have on getting squeezed again from from both ways worth having a look at, at what the DAX is is doing on the morning we'll have a look in, in the moment as it just has come down in the last 30 minutes or so uh, but this market I don't necessarily expect too much today uh, in the way of movement you see uh, the recovery that we had back on the sit strong and then yesterday a relatively flat day overall from from where we opened uh, and I, I kind of expect that to be the, the same thing uh, today quick look over at that DAX which is coming down and just on that area of support from the morning was the initial high uh, at quarter past one so that would be uh, somewhere to mark up and an important level to have on bigger move to the downside you could probably be you know, waiting for these trends to break which you know would be at a similar time or could be at a similar time uh, considering that move uh, as well to the upside those highs if they were to go you can see why today's r1 and the higher the day were as important as we go back to the fifth you can see that was the morning high uh, which we haven't come back to test before then surprise again getting squeezed but not necessarily expecting too much today in the, the way of uh, big movement in, in equities Oil, as Ant mentioned, you've got some key levels uh, in play and, and that low from yesterday, just putting this onto that daily continuation chart now, you can see just how important that was just from the back, uh, the beginning, I should say, of June and, and then uh, January as well. So really key level. That's to, to break and, and you're now getting to that $50 handle and uh, I'd say below that $49.37 is, is an area I'd have marked up, which was the low we had back in uh, November last year to the upside and really when you could perhaps say well look what a great level of support we're now drifting to the upside uh, the breakdown that we had on from the low uh, of the end of July that we broke yesterday uh, cleanly 53 55 so that's probably the the points that I would have marked up and uh, at the moment we're, we're looking like we are drifting back to that area which you know looking at oil previously in the last couple of years when you get these big moves and retracements you know really good opportunities to get short back on those uh, so I'd have that certainly marked up you can see the original low from yesterday at 53.12 and, and then that area 53.55 marked up on that uh, as well so keep an eye on obviously what the DAX is going to do for, for equities um, I think the, the upside today might just be limited a touch uh, the pound obviously coming to a key level, euro uh, similar um, to, to keep an eye on and, and, uh, and gold as well as mentioned just getting squeezed from both directions but probably favouring the upside just considering the overall trend that uh, we have been on. As usual, any questions uh, please do let us know. I hope you all have a, a great trading day uh, and I'll catch you in the chat.